Welcome back, sports fans. This is Moving the Needle Podcast, another episode coming your way. And uh, yeah, it was so fun. She was out in South Africa on a holiday, which I'm sure we'll get to, but it is none other than Miriam Nicole, a multiple world champion on the downhill bike, a World Cup champion, multiple winner, and just an amazing person to have on the circuit. We haven't had much of her on the race season, which I'm sure we'll dig into and she's had to deal with and speak to. But it was awesome that, uh, firstly, welcome to the show. And secondly, Thank you. So, Hello. so awesome that we met up a little bit when you came to South Africa. But you seem open and eager to the podcast world, which not everyone is comfortable with. Oh, why? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, some people avoid it. Some people enjoy it. Um, uh, no, I'm, I love it, and I kind of like this kind of uh, format now. Like, I find it cool, and I listen more and more some podcasts while driving or doing boring trainings. So, yeah, that's uh, that's a really good uh, good thing. I like it. Yeah, I think back when I was uh, on Trek, which was when I was a lot younger, ten, no, fifteen years ago, maybe I don't know, ten. I was listening to a lot of podcasts and I threatened to start a show, right? And I must say, it got me through a lot of road intervals and road rides when maybe you don't have a training partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes, you know, you can be with some people and sometimes when you're on your own and you have to stay low intensity, a lot like how it was this year, it's uh, it's really good to have a shoot. To, yeah, to listen to someone, to a new story, and it's really inspiring. So, What's some of your favorites or what, what's a go-to so, host the last for you one I series? listen, I like to listen a bit any style, but the last, the last one I listened was a doctor that is working in emergency in France during like catastrophic things. And, and I like the relationship between racing and like... Uh, unexpected risk situation and how to deal with uh, with the unknown and so that was my last one and it was kind of a crush so here you are <laughs> and you've had oh, shucks you know i mean i know everyone's spoken at nauseum but you've had a lot of time i guess to yourself as well as for lack of a better term in your own head even though that is yeah. the injury you're dealing with um, yeah so it was uh it's been I'm not even counting, maybe 10 or 11 months. No, yeah, 10. It was in February. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've, had, I've had to go through a lot of different stages. I would say the definitely the worst one was when I was not able to walk for 20 minutes during four months uh, per day. That was the longest one and, and hardest one because you're like, how long is it going to stay like this? And today, um, today it's really funny because I'm, I start my first day back on training program today. So we are going to do it all the December, December months really easy, but we want to have something co consistent. And uh, yeah, today was the first day. So a bit of course this morning and a nice ride this afternoon. And uh, and here I am. <laughs> so oh, really there we uh, <laughs> we've got things to celebrate. Then that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, so, at what at what point did you see light at the end of the tunnel? Because you've come back into training or thinking you can get back into it, and then these symptoms sometimes um, reappear. And you've yeah. clearly been very smart this time around. Having you know, you had to be. But where did you I don't know start? if I had been smart uh, all the time, but it's just like so hard and so different to what you are used to. I'm used to go like to don't listen if it's painful, if it's just like go and train and just go and train. And yeah, it's uh, I feel like so right now I have no idea, to be honest, how this is going to be if during like tough training with high intensity if it's going to be completely fine or if it's still a bit weak but I will see but definitely since I can just ride my bike and just do some activity I'm like well you know that's already super good so if I can get more and I'm super confident I will get more it's cool 
But uh, when I went back into the racing in Loudanviel, uh, so that was end of August, I start of feeling better because before I, I wasn't able to have uh, to handle some super noisy situation or just it was just too much for the brain. So when I started going on to the race, it felt better and I could ride. I went to Léger, I could ride the bike park. Of course, at this time, I had to do it only a few runs. And I worked with my physio, Caroline, the physio of the team. And then after the last World Cup, Monsentan, everything went, went good. But I went back into training after Monsentan and the gym did a big setback. So I had to wait again two weeks doing nothing. And I was like, okay, it's time to go on holiday. Even if you haven't raced this year, it was a tough one. So I took a flight and flew to South Africa. And that's how we met. <laughs> yeah. And... um how did you come about South Africa? Because there's obviously quite a lot of listener bases from South Africa, yeah. so they're eager to hear, and there's some questions like what what was your favorite part and maybe yeah. why you picked South Africa? Uh, because we were, I've been, how many times have we been to Peter Maritz books? Three times, I think, three times. And uh, I was always frustrated to go to Peter Maritz book, Peter Maritz book, but not to Cape Town because you hear a lot about Cape Town. And I was like, okay, this is a time flights were cheap and uh, I wanted some sun, some good riding. Coming south, south Africa were totally fine to borrow some bikes. So I could, we made it just like two days before click. And we made it with Gaetan for four fun times. And I would say in a short time, we could uh, road the three good spots out there. So it was cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it was cool. The story is quite funny how we how we met up because you're on a sh holiday that was, what, 10 days, something like that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and just like your mentality of go, 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 you wanted to fit in a lot of things. Yeah, so went, of course, like, because it's just too nice. We, we wanted to see everything. <laughs> we had good guides. We had good guides, yeah. Sven and you. Well, the story goes we were going to meet for our shop ride, and then you said you're going surfing, which was on your bucket list, or Gaetan's bucket list. <laughs> and I got a text at about 3 or 4 p.m., hey, we're going surfing if we can maybe ride afterwards or push the ride a bit. And I just looked at the message thinking, they're gonna have a great time. The surf spot's a little far away. Like they're not, they're not prioritizing riding because you know often on holidays I don't even take a bike. And then I saw a message that I missed when I was halfway up the mountain. Said we're on our way. <laughs> so then I tried to call you. Your phone was flat because you're being a tourist taking videos and photos. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, shucks, like I can't. If they go to the bottom, then they don't know where they're gonna go. So I race down. You guys wrote a handwritten note on your car. <laughs> and I saw these two people riding around the bike shop, maybe looking for the start of the trails. And uh, luckily, I found these random tourists for a ride. And we had a great time, a super cool sunset. And the trades were amazing. So, yeah, it was like really worth it. Do you think um, how much you've been forced to stay away from the bike as well as the racing? Do you think there's a a, a level of appreciation um, that that you'll of have course, now yeah. getting back, like this, you know, the simple things in life as well as just going for a ride, whether it's a training ride or not? You know, do you think that mm. is something you'll appreciate a lot more? Yeah, of 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 course. Normally, going riding at the end of the season is not my priority, but uh, definitely and discovering, you know, like during this time you. You're like, okay, so I'm not able to train. I'm not able to race, but what do I really love? And, you know, just exploring new place is definitely something that I love. And for me, that was uh, the best time. And of course, when you, you're not able to ride your bike and you're just on the bike with a super good, good uh, trail, the weather were perfect. So you enjoy it even more. Yeah, that's for sure. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you never think something that you're so passionate about or love. Or I myself got very burnt out, and I, and I think you go through yeah. phases in your career um, where it becomes a job. You, everyone will laugh and say, "How can you say such a thing?" But there was times where I was going out riding because it was on the training program, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes a lot of people are, are like you're so lucky to be training and biking riding every day and i am definitely so lucky but sometimes i see my brother going to work and i know he's gonna sit in front of a computer but because you're just on a saddle every day and sometimes it can get tough and you're just like exhausted and i'm like oh, i wish i could just go in front of a computer today so, like, it, it happens one or two times during winter when it's just too much. But, yeah, when you get uh, private from biking like this year, yeah, you enjoy things even more, definitely. Have you been mentally be able to switch off? I mean, when, when, we're, when you're racing so much and it's in the season, you're thinking about performance and the races and it's off-season, you're often thinking about improving. So it's sort of just... For me, it was all I thought about for a long time. Um, and and this time, were you able to switch away and now focus only on the recovery and not the pressure of performance? I would say it did help a lot when the season was over because the whole season I was trying to come back for this okay. race. So it started to – I wanted to come back for Fort William World Champs and I was trying and trying, and then I had this huge setback where I was like, oh, I have to wait for another a few weeks to settle down. So big disappointment. And then there was this race in Andorra, and I was like, oh, that would be super cool to be racing in Andorra. So I was trying and pushing. So the whole season didn't felt so good. And in yeah, when I could not make it for Andorra, yeah, called Max Comensal and I had meeting with all my with the team and I was like, it's it's just like too much. So I made the decision that I'm not gonna be able to race this year because I'm just trying and and the doctors made me understand that the more you will try to push, the more the longer it will take. So yeah, definitely after Ludanviel, so the last two months of the season were easier because I, I really um, accept that I was going to be on the race and not racing. But uh, but yeah, it did help. And in a way, I took it, uh, it was cool because, you know, when you are racing, you always really focus on the results, on the performance. And, you know, you have some fans who are there and I always feel so frustrated to don't spend time with them to don't be able to give my sponsors all the time they need. Like, and this time I was like, 5 a.m. photo shoot, I'm in. You know, like, it, it was like, and the signing session, I'm in. So it was yeah, really the beers cool at the, be able... the after party, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With the fans, you know. Was, with, Keep the fans was happy. The first time. <laughs> it was the first time I could party as well. And that was a big, big thing for me. So... Definitely the the last few World Cups going there, seeing all the people from the racing, it's just like a big family, so it, it helps a lot. Yeah, definitely. And your team, you spoke about Max Comencel and your team, like seems such a family environment in a good way. Um, and you've been with them for as long as I can really remember. And yeah, 2010, so it's going to be 14 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's incredible, it's yeah. Science flies, it's crazy. <laughs> it does, huh? Tell me, yeah, and, and, so and riding forever. with someone, you know, Max Comensal, you mentioned chatting him and phoning him. I mean, there might not be a more passionate bike owner out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. To see the passion, and he still comes to what I, it looks like most races, every race. Um, yeah. for year, for uh, many years now, you know, it's tough traveling, even if it's in Europe to all these races, when you've got to run a company like that, what, what's it like? What is he like? What is it like riding for him? Yeah, what is it, it like? It, what's he it's like? really good to, to have the team being sponsored by Comensal because of course he's like this cool boss, you know, 
really cool and uh, when we are racing and he's there you know when we are watching gopro the line he's so excited about it and he always come when we are having dinner at night is I, I yeah i feel like it's just his passion and he loves it too much i i think he, he raced mega avalanche in la reunion la, yesterday so really like, that's so cool yeah he did race so i'm like that's so cool so yes having him as a um, the the main partner uh, main sponsors of the team is, is just unreal and uh we i know you know he he got my back you know like this year he supported me a hundred percent despite this year and i was so grateful you know it's uh in sports sport can be cruel you know like when you're on top level everybody's smiling at you and cheering and then when you're up down it's often not the same, but this year I was like, "Wow, I'm I'm super pleased that uh, that sponsors are being really cool and understanding the situation." And the whole team have been in a big trouble, like with the three main riders being injured, and Max was still like, "We are behind you guys. We will always be behind you." And that's a good feeling to have, you know. Like there is a good. Uh, trust between uh, between each other so that's yeah that's cool. so important yeah. and it's not always possible you know some some teams or bosses or owners yeah. are, have to be business orientated you know yeah. but it seems that passion shines through and like th- it doesn't mm-hmm. seem to bring any more pressure having him there because some if a boss is there sometimes it brings more pressure or there's like a energy yeah. um uh, but I don't see that with him, like you say. If he's just always nah, around, it's just too you know, cool, just too it. cool to. <laughs> <laughs> he's so too. cool. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> but when he's around, you know, you you can feel some pressure because he has a good vibe and 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 he show you his arms and it, it's written relax. <laughs> he has a oh, nice I haven't seen that. Oh, is it? Relax. Has he got a tattoo? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but he will be happy to say to show this tattoo. Yeah. It's really, I think that's, it's, it's that's nice so and, cool. And it, instead of bring, bringing pressure, I feel like it's completely the opposite. It's just like uh, we like, I think it's the same for Amori and Thibaut. We like to explain him this line, why is it faster and how do you feel and what's going to be the big struggle uh, challenge. And uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to share with him. That's cool. What is it like being teammates with two of easily the fastest but also the wildest riders on two wheels in this new era <laughs> yeah sometimes i feel like i'm getting old <laughs> <laughs> what but watching they, them yeah because they are like they have a learned energy that is like boom they are super bomb and they're always always like fighting always laughing always and training with them can be tricky because like they are pushing really hard and on team camps, the bar is super high. So to keep up with the, these two is uh, is uh, stimulated, but can be a tough one because sometimes I tend to forget that I am not the same age. I am a girl, and and it can be sometimes not uh, not easy. But they bring such a good vibes, and with the team, like you said, it's like a family. So it's it's really nice to to be with good people. I feel like I've always been in the, the team where the atmosphere was key and was uh, good. And I think this is important. Do you think those two subconsciously are competing even at team camp? Like it's a right, it's friendly, yeah. but for of sure, course. even if it's team camp or practice, if one guy does a fast run, yeah. maybe they don't Thibaut say that- anything, but but then the next one goes up and beats the time and they, oh, yeah. they're they lifting for each sure. other's level, right? For sure. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, Thibaut Daprela is racing for anything, 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 anything uh. in life. He's always racing. So, of course, when he's, when these two are doing timing, for Thibaut, is like he knows his goal is to be the fastest. Amori will be more focused on what he has to do, on himself, knowing that it might not be the time to be the fastest. But Titi is uh, 
super high racer. So we will always want to smash the time and, uh, and, uh, and it's good for that. And that brings a good uh, emulation. So, you know, sometimes when we are last day of the team camp, everybody is a bit down, he will still be like, <laughs> okay, let's race. That's funny. Yeah, it makes sense though. I think Amri's, you know, gaining that experience, so maybe realizing, yeah, mm -hmm. being fastest at team camps not, not always the smartest thing. And Tebow's probably young oh, and so course. competitive, um, but it's definitely yeah. going to lift their game. So I can't wait to see them healthy as well. Yeah, it's actually so yeah. crazy. I don't know if I've seen that sort of unluckiness in in one team in in a I long, don't long think time. So. So, but that's yeah. part of what you said, like the highs and lows of sport. No one is immune to it. It's just exactly so. And but you, how do you, you deal with it? Just... Like, how do you deal with knowing? You know, you yeah, you can say that's just the sport, highs and lows. But you have to emotionally and physically deal with it all the time. Yeah, I I had a good mental coach that I started working this year for racing, of course. But because I didn't race, it was good. I had her during this time of my year because we did a lot of good work to get through my emotions to, because like every time I was being good, I was like, okay, I'm ready to race. And then like a setback and I was like, I'm not going to be able to race this year. So it was just like a lust of energy all the time. So I did uh, some great mental work and I was pleased to have someone to release because I'm not going to lie. It's been like at some point it was tough. You know, you're scared, like, how is going to be the rest of your life if I'm only able to work 20 minutes per day, you know, when you are used to, to be an athlete. So during those times, I was happy, but we, I focused on uh, those little things. And like you said, I think that's why afterwards you are even more grateful. So, of course, this is cool um, life lesson. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I... I was super well surrounded, friends, family, and the, when I went on back onto the race, onto the race, it helped as well to see everybody. And what brought on working with a mental coach? Because some athletes mm -hmm. maybe start quite early with them, but you're quite late in your career. Have you had before, or is this kind of yeah, the first, had... first time? No, uh, I've had before in the French team. When I was junior, they introduced us to to some mental coach, and I had worked with one for the last five years, same of Loic, really. And uh, and I felt I felt like it was cool to work with a woman, and uh, I needed some change. You know, sometimes uh, everything can go well, but uh, changing is always good. So I feel like you know now. Every athlete knows that uh, it's made uh, fifty percent physically. Um, no, I would say how many? Forty percent uh, physically, then uh, no, thirty, thirty, and the rest is mental. So you that's think like forty percent. Oh yeah, for, what even physical even, skill, uh, mental? Yeah. What are the three brackets 25, you look at? Yeah. 25 physical, 25 technical, your skills on the bike, and then the rest is mental, for sure. That's crazy, you know, like, and to be able to go to the race in the warm-up area to feel these vibes, it's all where the magic happens. How do you deal with, the, with uh, how your training went? Imagine if it went really bad and you still have to race to be able to switch and still be able to do a good run. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really important. And I feel like all the athletes, uh, all the athletes know. And for mountain bike downhill to learn how to let go at the right moment, but still be in control. That's a, that's a tricky point to, to handle. It's such a crazy sport. I mean, I know there's some fascinating sports out there and obviously downhill skiing could be similar, the one rand format. Motocross, you kind of have time. Exactly. You can make a mistake. But downhill with so many variables and, and this one mm -hmm. run and, and the margins are so small, it's actually crazy how 
consistent all the riders are and yeah, yeah they're crashes, but it's it's pretty damn impressive what what the mm-hmm. athletes are able to do. So what in your mind makes a successful downhiller? Um you have to be committed. <laughs> you have to yeah, to how do you say to have a good underbar um yeah, to have a good un bon coup de guide, we say like yeah, to know how to ride your bike, to have some base skills, some good skills. A rider that are oh, that is having fun on the bike, fun is like of course it's super key, and uh, and consistent. Like uh, it's it's just like uh, you have to go every day and to to be strong on the bike to build your speed and to. To be patient because like like you said before there is a lot of low and uh, i feel like there is much more low than high and to be okay with this and to always like learn from it uh, there there's been some lows that i feel like i did <laughs> i didn't learn when i was younger you know like you, you can break a bone and you're not asking yourself what happens i, I was exhausted that was the last run of the day but uh, you did again the same mistake, <laughs> you know. So to to learn from your mistake and to to be consistent and to have fun, I would say, and to be super well surrounded. I feel like a champion cannot be a champion on his own. I've been yeah. lucky. I started with my three older brothers that bring me into downhill, and then straight away I had a really good team. So I've, it, it, the team, you know, good mechanics, some good. Uh, to be well surrounded, it's uh, it's super important. That's why I had talked to all the private here. That uh, like Camille, for example, she was sleeping in her van and she made her first uh, World Cup, and then she ended up being world champs. That's uh, that's amazing because when you are alone and not many people around you, it's uh, definitely harder. So super grateful to have a good support. Uh, I need to perform. Yeah, and how much now looking back do you think having three brothers influenced your riding, your career? You know, Rachel as well. She had yeah. two of the most successful brothers sort of egging her on, you know. It's actually quite mm-hmm. a quite a big help. There's quite a few similarities there with uh, Rachel and yourself. Yeah, um, I feel like uh, I just wanted to keep up uh, with them, to follow them to do like them, they were just my inspiration. And that was so cool, you know, to just go on the race. At, at the beginning, it was really not about racing. It was just about how cool it was to take my parents' van, all three, and just to, to go in the, in a van and on the French, uh, French cup. And I would end up weekends with a medal because most of the time I was the only girl. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that was uh, we were camping. So at the beginning, it was just for the for the trip and the adrenaline on the bike when you when when you ride downhill. I was doing a bit of cross country, and I quickly stopped because I was like, this is definitely not for me. It was way too hard, and downhill were much cooler. And so at the beginning, it was really cool. And then I started and did my first years in junior. I only started second year junior. Uh, and I was um, getting a bit more professional. And I felt, I feel like South Africa has been the turn of being professional because everybody for this track, remember with this long pedaling section, like everybody start training for this section and you know I haven't had a seat post on my downhill bike <laughs> because I couldn't stay up sprinting the whole way down so I had to sit down and from then Peter Murray's book I feel like it became more and more professional and you had to train and then I had a coach and, and so on so it was Peter Maritzburg was the cause of your starting to train so you can thank <laughs> yeah. thank yeah. the pedaling section of peter marito back yeah. in the day because I, I would say there. that was kind of your weakness back in the day was pedaling <laughs> that was exactly right it's <laughs> fair to say wasn't my thing. 
I, I was doing great on every race, always in the top five, and I couldn't make it into the top 10 in Peter Moritz's book. So I was like, maybe you have something to, to learn. So yeah, I felt like 2009, I, uh, I started uh, training properly. And you're like, hey, I'm not a junior now. So if you want to be good in edits, you have to, to train. And physical, physical at the beginning was, yeah, really hard. But it's actually, it's a quite an inspirational story because you weren't just straight to a phenom from junior, straight to the top of the elite podium all the time. Like you had these yeah. waves of potential. We could see the raw talent and the skill on a gnarly track, but you had to really work and figure out your weaknesses. Mm. Yeah, that's why, you know, I, in 2012, I remember Red Bull did help me. And and that's a thing that it teach me to be surrounded by the good people. So I start having a physical coach and then to be more, to do more quality in the gym, to have a coach with me in the gym and to start making decisions myself about uh, what what was the plan you know it's not like someone giving you a plan and you follow it it's just like being involved in the plan and on the, you know yourself more than anybody so what are your weakness what do you want to improve at the beginning it was and still i wasn't bought with some easy physical uh, fitness you know not, i wasn't born super strong i have to work hard to be to be able to pedal like someone would not have to work that hard. And then it was the jumps because I did hurt myself a lot of, on jumps and jumping became, why it was not that bad, became a, a big weakness where, for example, in 2019, I won world jumps going around the last jump, you know? So I, it was uh, from recently that I start feeling more and more confident uh, in the air. Do you think it, okay, it was, it sounds like it was some sort of weakness, but it also, I think there was a new generation and riders coming up yeah. that were like better than usual for the ladies at jumping. Would you yeah. say that as well? Yeah. At the same yeah, time that it wasn't your sure. strong suit, but there were some ladies that, we weren't yeah. used to seeing doing jumps. And then now, I mean, mm -hmm. now we're talking Valley and Gracie Hemstreet. They have grew up in a bike park. Yes. Jumping is like beyond a strength, you know? Yeah. I feel like before you would come, I would come from uh, riding bikes from the bike school where you would do cross-country, trial or downhill. And you had, there were some people coming from BMX and they were super uh, better at jumping. And we didn't have that much bike park, uh, track back in the days. And I feel like Bali, Thibaut d'Aprela was the first generation to grow up in bike park with gnarly jumps and, and I, you could really see the difference. So yeah, I feel like it was a big turn. And now <laughs> I just, I saw two days ago, comments all kids advert and I was like, how old are they? So I went checking and they were doing crab apple in, in Whistler being seven and nine years old. I no. was like, whoa. <laughs> so you're just like, hey, <laughs> that's insane. I've never jumped crab apple. <laughs> and what, um, what's that mental process like? Because I think quite a few people, and I've heard you speak about it before, which is super helpful. But that process of identifying the weakness, and it's and that's a mental thing as well. Physically pedaling, you can work on, but it's not a scary thing. You know, you shouldn't get hurt yeah. from learning to pedal yeah. better. Jumping, you can get hurt even uh, while you're improving. You know. Yeah. So I feel like it was really important to start to start low. You know, like with some. Whistler, for example, some small jump. Whistler did help me a lot, I have to be honest. Uh, yes, because it, yeah, it's all about the improvement and the progression. So a lot of people after were like, how did you went over your fear on jumping? It's just about starting small again. It's just like, 
And for example, right now, I haven't write much this year and I'm going to build some confidence back, build some feeling. So for the jump, it was easy in Whistler because you have all these different track and you can start small and be better and better. So it helped a lot to be in the same place and and jumping. And then just like my coach back here in these days were like, just turn your wheel a little bit and just feel comfortable and just leave one hand just to feel like, you know, to feel good in the air and feel safe. To manage the balance and, um, between now, the bike, so. Oh, sorry. I, no, sorry. I didn't mean, I no, just no, thought yeah. I was a, didn't hear and now do you, what does it feel like getting to a downhill track knowing you've worked on it and it can be a skill that you can rely on, you know? Yeah, it's more natural. And I'm not going to lie, when the jumps are sketchy and scary, you, I'm still um, doubting a bit about how it will go. And I'm not the one that will go first. I like to just like send the young generation being like, how does it go? You know, you just look yeah, and yeah. then you're like, okay. That's experience. Why, why That's not scared. Go? That's yeah. experience. <laughs> why would I go first? You know, like there is no point. And, um, and then I would be, um, yeah. And then, you know, it feels good and it's, uh, it's more relaxing, you know, when I was walking tracks, I was always like, even the, some small jumps, it started to be uh, challenging and I would waste so much energy. So it's just like earning some, some energy because you're like, ah, oh, I know this, I can do this. So easy. So there, there clearly is ego with female racing or sports, right? But compare it to the males, like you spoke about Thibaut and Amory and, and jumping things first and like there's no point half the time, but there's kind of an ego thing to it. Does it exist that much in the ladies' field? <laughs> like showing off and proving uh, something and jumping something first? Yeah. To... Yeah, I feel like it will be more um, about starting to own the competition so if you go straight it's just what you show like not showing any weakness so for example like uh, you you would see someone really confident first run doing all the jumps and only one you'll be like hey she's feeling good on the bike and and it's more yeah it's more about uh, i wouldn't say it's ego it's just like the process of racing to 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 show that you are you're ready for for the battle you know but uh, but i feel like we are we are we are we are doing so much more easy <laughs> than with the men with the with the ego like the atmosphere is different it's it's completely different and right right now i would say the atmosphere between the girls it's super chill compared to uh, back in the days it was way more competitive maybe because uh, there were a lot of Frenchies in competition but I don't feel this with the men even if the men are doing good but back in the days for sure I had some uh, have you jumped this jump because it's super windy eh? like don't do it but she's uh. just done it so it was a bit uh how do you what's the english name to say um well it's yeah, mind games it, it was yeah mind games now it's like it's we i wouldn't be ashamed to ask uh, uh, uh valley or camille or marine to follow her doing a jump because i'm not feeling comfortable because we all know if the jump is doable, everyone will do it. And, uh, and yeah, I wouldn't have any problem with this. And I feel like if I'm, if I'm good to ask this, it's because I feel like there is not, uh, there is not bad, bad mind games between the girls like that. Nowadays, I feel like uh, it's super chill. When we are racing, yeah, it seems like, like we have no friends. Yeah, it seems but like when everyone gets on practice, well. It's a super healthy competition. 
Yeah, really. Really, of course, you know, we are competitors and I have people who are more friends than others, but it's more, you know, like relationship. It's not uh, because of uh, she's better on the bike or so. It, it's uh, it's good because coming onto the race feels good. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think the guys as well, I mean, they are head games and Loic's spoken about it and I'm around to see some of it and I was around when it was happening. It's it's the nature of of sports and, and, and there should be, you know, it's part of the mental aspect mm -hmm. is controlling how you react to something that someone said or someone did or jumped at first yeah. and you have to be experienced to know that it shouldn't affect you, you know? Mm -mm. No, it's, uh, it, it, it's easy at the moment, I would say. It's, it's easy. And yeah. you've spoken about this balance you've wanted to find or have found, like these injuries. You've had some really, you're dealing with this tough injury now, but you've had some big injuries, physical injuries as well. And you kept coming back to saying, maybe some of them you could have avoided and the balance thing that you're trying to really sort of get mm. into your racing career and life. Mm -mm. Yes. It's, uh, it's all about, uh, yeah, learning from your mistake. And, uh, I feel like, yeah, I'm going to be 34 next year. So I feel like, you know, how to avoid most of them. And uh, being super focused is so important. And I tend to be like when I'm having fun to play with the limits, you know, so you're, you're always like trying to push a little bit. And so it's, uh, it's, it's hard to don't uh, do a mistake. But I feel like, you know, I've done. <laughs> and um, at, at this time in your career and with what you've gone through what keeps you going at 34 and and through this tough injury and the ones in the past like what drives you to still go through some of these hard times because i feel like i've been through some tough times mentally and physically that i have learned and understood and now i feel like I want to do a season or, or a few season, um, feeling just good because like there were always like this physical to fix, being fit enough to be able to race to fit, being good at jumping, good enough at jumping to be able to race. And then I've been through some mental challenge with the concussion. So just feeling good and racing learning how to manage this uh, this time so yeah it, and i just love riding my bikes so you know everybody's like when are you gonna stop and i'm like you know you you feel it when you want to stop you you're like you don't want to go and train anymore it starts to be hard so for the moment i i still want and need to so i'm like uh Let's go, you know. I I feel like I I have some left in the tank. <laughs> yeah, no, that it sounds like it. You've got some. There's something in there that you maybe all these lessons are gonna come out yeah. and help you for the next few seasons. Mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful and and awesome to look at something that it's not. Uh, what's the saying? Uh, it's happened for me, you know, not to me. This has happened for me. Like there's a reason it's for some, you know, it's tough to stomach it at the time, but oh, yes. you know, a year or two years afterwards, you realize, okay, th that was such a big learning experience for me. And it's made me stronger as a person or stronger as a racer. Yeah. Yeah. No, of course. Uh, after I'm not going to lie that this year has been challenging and I don't want to be stupid with uh, my brain. You know, you've got only one. So I will just go year after year. And when I feel like I'm done, I'll, I'll be done. But uh, yeah, just train is important for me. Is there even a proper diagnosis other than a concussion? Do the doctors give you 
a, a diagnosing version of a concussion. Or I, I, I mean, I've had a concussion, but it's just a broad term. Yeah, so I had, um, I've been to a center in France where they did some tests. And regarding how you react to the test afterwards, I felt really bad. And I went in Zurich. And what helped to really understand that something was wrong was that I had Gaeta next to me and I had to put some narrow straight and they were like, okay, you press the button when you see the narrow straight. And it was like this sideways. And I would press, I would see it straight. And Gaetan was next to me and he was like, are you sure? <laughs> and I was like, yes. <laughs> so that was, yeah. So that was what, yeah, diagnostic because when you do an MRI, you don't see any problem 99% of the time. So when, at the beginning, when this happens, I was just like, oh, so that's for real. And I do feel that if I had known what to do straight after a crash like this, when you have the symptoms, it would have helped. I've been doing like some bad things because we were one month before the first World Cup. I did crash and instead of progressive progression back into training i was just like it's not a concussion it's just i'm okay i took a few days off and i'm back into training normal because i've had a week off now it's enough and the gym put so much pressure in the head that it mess and it's just too much for the brain so yeah it, if you know what to do straight away after a crash, it's really important. And this is the thing I would love every people to know. It's just doing something quickly, but super easy. For example, if you crash the day after, just check, are you able to walk 20 minutes? And if it's okay, are you able to bike on flats an hour and then build back up? And that's yes. the phase I missed. And and I just did. And every time you're trying to push too hard, your brain is just like enough, enough, enough. And then what I had to do is uh, deal with my eyes. I had some, what did help a lot was to do all the work with my eyes. So yeah, it's super complicated. But uh, from what I understood, if that when you have a crash, the brain moves into the, into, the head and so it can be some disconnection in the hair in the eyes in the proprioception so it's just like the tough one is to find where which system is to to be fixed and oh, yes, yes. 85 yeah and 85 percent of concussion goes back into normal in two weeks but if you don't do the right process or for other reason it can be a post-concussion symptom. And that's, for example, what, what have been true and what we've seen also athletes uh, going through. So people should not stress about uh, concussion, about crashing, because if you do the right thing, normally everything should be fine. Yeah, there was a, a, a youngster in our bike shop that, that clearly had a mild concussion. And I tried to say, you know, you need to test yourself mm. with that return to play thing, which I knew about. But it's tough for me to give the knowledge. Mm. You know, I wanted him to go to a doctor yeah. or just check his symptoms. And after I had a concussion yeah. in Whistler, so that's normally like August, missed the race, tried to do oh. worlds. It, it went okay, I thought at the time. But then about a month or two, I went yeah. for an ankle issue and the doctor had experience. He was a, a, a Cairo and an osteo and kind of like a guru guy that I always see. And I asked him about my ankle and then we started talking about the concussion and he checked a few things and my eyesight wasn't correct either. And this was two or three months afterwards. And he said, there was no ways you were fighting fit when you raced last. I'm not saying it wasn't, you weren't healthy, like the brain could have been recovered, but there were still yeah. eyesight issues and things that he needed to tweak in my neck and and all these things. So they yeah, can linger. Exactly. Shucks, it's crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah. But the more yeah, more you speak about great. it, Tane, it's 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 helpful. It's it's scary, but like you said, done correctly, it's another injury, and the more yeah. knowledge that's out there can just help people. Mm-mm. Yeah, exactly. I feel like there's there is no shame. You know, it's just uh, there is uh, something going wrong into a system. It's just having the right tools and to to know how to to get back to avoid this kind of long period injury. And do you think, um, so you studied to be a physio, right? A physiotherapist while racing. Yeah. Did that yeah, yeah. clearly and, help with some no, of managing some of the stuff? Yeah, and all my injuries, what I felt like this is a reason why I came back from injury quite easy because I knew my body super well and what to do, which action to do. But concussion, no lesson about it. Like I never had, <laughs> I never had someone talking about it. You just learn that you can have a bruise and you can die if you have a bruise inside your brain. And those is the bad one, but concussion. And it's still super unknown. Even I went to see some really good neurologists and there is still some question mark around it about oh, big time. Why there's, there there's some experts yeah. that can't tell you everything about it yeah. and I was like how come can we go on the moon and you cannot tell me what's happening right now and they were like because there is millions of connection and all the system are connected that and everybody is different where you crash make a difference as well so this is why we have this world concussion but it's like there is tons of different concussion into this world so i was like okay <laughs> i was gonna say that's if you believe we went to the moon back then <laughs> and we still don't know how to treat concussions now or go back to the moon just yeah, gonna put that out exactly. there exactly <laughs> yeah what um yeah. but so studying and racing like yeah, people have talked about it but just reflecting in that uh would you do that all again uh are you happy no. oh. i'm mean, I mean, assume you're very happy you have it but would you try do that again it was super 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 tough and 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 sometimes i feel like it's uh all of the burnout as well from these years it, it was just too intense. So this year was also a year where I felt like, like I rested a bit my my head and my body from what I've been through from 2010. Yeah, from 2010 to 2018. So eight years I've been studying. And uh, the last few years were really intense. Because, you know, I was doing work experience in hospital and you're like, hey, I have to go racing. And they're like, well, you're in the hospital. You cannot just go like this, you know. So I was starting my days really early training and then going to school or hospital to work. And I definitely didn't have enough training. So that's why I had to deal with some injuries as well because I wasn't strong enough. But today I'm super happy from everything I've learned. And, you know, I feel so much more relaxed about my future because, you know, you have uh, you have something you can rely on. So it was tough. I wouldn't think I would be able to manage this life again. But uh, don't. don't. <laughs> that's very, very impressive. That is just mm-hmm. anyone that's able to do that. It's so impressive. Yeah, it's just having to accept that I, when I was back in these days, studying was more important than racing. So you have to you have to give a priority to something. It was like and you gave the, it to studying, it wasn't even important. though you were on the yeah, world circuit. Because, yeah, definitely because I it was uh, you know you know you're not gonna race the whole your whole life, but you know you're gonna need something to learn and I. I wanted to have this, um, I wanted to pass my test and that was really my priority because I knew like I could ride the bike and <laughs> and I, I will be okay with riding. But yeah, then there were some injuries that 
weren't planned because of not being fit enough. But uh, yeah, you have to give some priority to to what you want. The world works in mysterious ways, studying to be a physio <laughs> and dealing with these injuries because you're not quite prepared and maybe needing a break. And now you've got a concussion that you've been dealing with to give the mind and body a rest. Like It's crazy. Yeah, that was, yeah, in back in the days, if you would have told me that it would go this way, <laughs> I would have been like, hmm. no, I think if. It's just like, yeah, the I, I did something really wrong. You would have seen me one month before the first World Cup because now my pro priority is racing. So <laughs> I was like training really hard. And, and for me, like it, there were no way of, uh, of what happened. So yeah, done. But I mean, we've spoken about a lot of the downs and, and I think you've got an amazing mindset, but there's been so many ups. Um, but did, did I get the research right that the first one was 2011 and then it took a while to get the next one, 2017? Yeah. Was there that big of a gap for the two World Cup wins? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> oh, well, that that is in the it. other question it is... You, you had to go over, up against what is considered kind of the GOAT, I guess. Uh, she was yeah, rather yeah, dominant yeah, during yeah. the period that you were trying to do double duty. Yeah. 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 I When I won my first World Cup, she was the first one to carry me in the finish area. So I was like, whoa, I just beat Rachel. And I was on flat pedal. My, yeah, my bike wasn't working so well at back in those days and I think when you when you have what you want to do it again it, you put your expectation so much higher that it's hard to do it so it took me a while but it was also during those years of studying that I was like hey you, you know you you have to be 100 person so yeah 2017 in Andorra was uh, when I start winning again, and I had two in two weekends. So I was like, "Oh, good." <laughs> That's yeah. nice. I forgot you were on flat pedals. That's also why you weren't the best peddler. I was like, I wanted to <laughs> ask, and I was looking at some old photos, but I couldn't find the flat pedals. But I knew you had flat pedals. Yeah, uh, yeah, that wouldn't flat have helped. Pedals, so uh... then. Those years, there was you put less pressure on yourself to win again or not? Like you kind of wanted to, the expectation goes up, but then you go, but I'm meant to be studying. So like what was the battle like mm. there in your mind? I don't know what happened this year. I just, maybe I could see the end of the tunnel because I finished studying in 2018 so, and the last year was all about just writing a memory, like a, a, a course. So maybe I could feel like a bit more fresh hair again. And uh, yeah, 2017, it just felt good and, and it clicked. Maybe Rachel wasn't there as well. <laughs> No, no, give yourself some credit. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, what yeah. is but that then, like uh, racing against Rachel when she was at her peak? She was super strong. And yeah, she was like training really high, hard. She was, you know, tallest, stronger. And she had two, she was two years older, two or three years older as well. So she had more experience. And she was just on the highs, so she was super high and, and flying. And and she just won every single race. So to stop stop her was uh, was uh, almost felt like impossible, you know. It was just two different planets. She was uh, riding uh, really good and mentally super strong by winning and winning and winning and so I guess it must have been really exhausted just 
perfect season that she she's done. Yeah, it's actually crazy. I mean, is it fair to say she's will go down in history? Like, can someone do something like that again? You know, can you we compare it to mm-hmm. Anne Caroline's song? Like, wh- what do you think yeah, about that? Yeah, I feel like, uh, yeah, for me, it's been like two different generation between Anne Caro and Rachel. So she, they both are queens of their generation, you know, and and I feel like it's going to be maybe a new one now uh, with some younger girls, but I feel like it's tighter now between between the girls. So when Rachel was winning, remember in Lindsay High, she won, won by 10 seconds, and I don't think we've seen this again after what she's done so it's it's more like homogenous now the girls so i i don't see someone being uh, at the moment in with the girls that are riding now i don't see anybody being really above everybody else i feel like it's more like a group because the level, yeah, I would agree. I think the the, the, the bikes, level of competition is bikes going faster. Eh? Yeah, the bikes are going faster. The track are better. People train more. There is like, I feel like it's just like, and it's gonna keep being this way. So, so it's kind of normal that because the disciplines improve, the riding skills improve as well. I wouldn't see why it would come backwards. Yeah, the competition, men and and ladies, it's it's so like you said, it's more compact now. There's more depth, um, and that yeah. makes me think like it's quite a challenge for everyone when they're making the finals. Only ten ladies. When I mean, you yeah, were at the races this year. year. Tane was coming back. We've got all these youngsters. Yeah, what? So you weren't racing, but you got to some of the races. You did some broadcasting, which is awesome, and I want to hear about that. But where are you at, and where do you think the riders are at with the new format? Um, so because I am UCI reps and I'm involved with uh, this riders' union, I know that we don't really like the riders. Don't really like the semi, even though I've never tried it. But from an outside point, I really loved watching the first race with the two race. I was like, oh, that's going to be exciting. I have nothing to do today and it's going to be two races in the same day. So that was the first uh, World Cup. But then I felt like um, you would see the, a bit the result before the result. You know, there were no, not that much of a show. And I felt like we we lost a bit the spirit of downing of this, you know, like this Samir's run or, or you know, those crazy things happening during this run. So for many reasons, I think riders are not uh, really happy with the semi. But for the sport in general, having some broadcast. Uh, run on TV is really good regarding for the business, you know, for the brands and and we're not going to lie, uh, all the athletes uh, wants to be supported by brands. So, yeah, if the semi is broadcasted, that's good. And maybe I would say if it's a day before or something like that, it would help to keep the final being special, more special. But yeah, if the semi is not broadcasted I don't see any personally I don't see any point of uh, of keeping it that's yeah I would say that's see. quite well summed up and said and I would say I have similar feelings uh, understanding I see the business model I can understand that um, I'm not in the room with all the talks so I don't have a huge opinion just you know it kind of feels like Sometimes the story has been told. You've still got the final, but yeah. There, yeah. there was something so special about that one run, 
um, and, and sleeping on a lead and all these things which are now changing. So the strategy of downhill yeah. is changing. So that is a is quite a big challenge, you know, for the core fan. And then, yeah, it's so difficult because you see the if they're going to broadcast it, then people seeing the numbers and that can help the sport. Like there's such so many opinions mm-hmm. in Catch Twenty Two. Yeah, I just feel if the riders really are not for it, I wonder if there's a middle ground. Do you think there's a world where next year there isn't a semi again? Is there any? I, I mean, you obviously you can't talk about what's not publicized in, in those meetings no, but, yet. But do you think yeah, there's a world where it could there go is back? Nothing, there is nothing official. I wouldn't say it would go back, but uh, I, I honestly don't know what will happen. But there is a chance of, a chance of a different format and, uh, and riders have shared their opinion. Uh, to the new organization and we are still waiting uh, to for discussion for next year so yeah personally for the first year i feel like it was good there is of course some uh, point that has to be improved but for the first year you know being completely new it was uh, it did run well and there were some really good thing i felt like the uh, watching the the drone shots, etc., were super cool to watch, and there is still things to improve. But it's a long-term contract, so I feel like uh, uh, if the riders are united to share, and I feel like the the marketing, the brand, the management, the team, the riders, the media, and the organization, the UCI has to be like in a good balance to find a good way and. Uh, uh, I hope this will be possible. Is it uh, how much energy does it take to be riders rep or involved in some of that stuff while while you're racing, or even in the off season? So, yeah. So it do, when you're racing, that was a big struggle because I was frustrated to don't do the job I, job I wanted to do regarding survey. I would talk for myself, but I would have loved before I would give my opinion. And for the girls, it was a bit easier because I could ask the 15 girls. But for the men, it was harder so to know what the opinion of everybody. So that's why they created this uh, writers' union. And now we have Emily Zingantana that is doing some great survey. And at least for me to give to the UCI is helpful because I'm like, Okay, so 90% of the people don't want Sumi anymore. At the next committee, can we change this? And you know, I have numbers and this helps a lot for me. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. Sometimes I think maybe it's a rider that isn't racing because then you can put a lot of effort at the races. But I understand you sort of need to be in the know and chatting to everyone. So... It's such a yeah. challenge when I when I hear you guys have to do a lot of this stuff at the race when you're trying to perform, you know, and yeah. you have to be thinking about yourself. Mm-hmm. Not selfish is not the correct word, but you yeah, have it's to all be about absorbed just in your team and yourself. Most... Yes, yes, yes. So the most of the job that I feel is during track walk, but this should should be done long long before. So. I have asked to have track ready before then just a week before, you know, to just go check and someone doing GoPro and then we can check if it's safe, if everything is, is perfect, like the B-zone is clean. So it's, it's in this way that we would love to see things improving. And regarding safety, of course, like uh, with concussion and uh, all the things, we would love to have uh, the same trained um, rescue team on every race that knows the sport, that knows, you know, like, man, it's, a, it's a tricky one to, to handle. If it was private, maybe that would be easier. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, safety is a big point we, we want to improve. 
yeah, that would be unreal if it was the same doctor and team. It just yeah. probably cost a small fortune or we need someone with yeah. passionate on bike experience that uh, is retired, you know, like it's things cost <laughs> money at the end of the day, even though the rider yeah. safety, yeah. I think should be, you know, at the, number one of the list. And I do think the organization is here to, to, to make a success of it. Their version might look a little yeah. different to some other people, but as a whole, there's no ways they don't want it to be a success. And mm. yeah, there's going to be teething issues and, and, yeah. That's, that does take time to – they obviously bit off quite a lot, you know, changing the format and all these things. Um, mm -mm. What was it like being in uh, the booth a bit, finish line, keeping busy at the races on the on the broadcast? Yeah, it was, uh, it was good because I felt like involved doing something and uh, it was nice to, to see – the girls doing this to race, you know, I felt more into it and, uh, and it allowed me to take some time to, to really see some detail. And, uh, yeah, so broadcasting the, the race was cool and it was just an experience. I love it. But uh, for me, you have to, yeah, my English is not like if I was born uh, in, in an English country, so it was a bit tricky at some point. So I feel like uh, <laughs> I wish I could have talked better. No, I I uh, I think you did really well, and also I think it is takes a lot of courage to do something in not your first language. So mm. um, I think the fans yeah. really appreciate it, having someone with more experience and, <laughs> yeah, it was good and, to just and uh, get, race yeah. results and credibility. Mm. So have you like thought idea. far into the future when Miriam Nicole is not racing? Like, does that just go into physio or are you not, you know, like some people study things and don't want to do it one day. Yeah, I don't see myself being indoor, so at the physio every day. So I am definitely, I love being outdoor and on the bike, but I feel like I could do both. And I also love sharing with younger generation, not to tell them, don't do what I did or don't do, but I get passionate to, to meet and see different athletes how do they work i'm so curious about it and i love to 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 share with them so i have no uh, fixed idea yet and i feel like i didn't allow myself to make a plan to i i know I'll, i will have so many things to do and but now I am focused on coming back, on training, and on smashing next season. So I, I want to give all my energy to this now. So for the future, it will be a mix. I don't know exactly how of uh, physio sharing and biking. <laughs> That's awesome. I got given some advice, and and I think everyone's story is unique, and you can't always take advice, right? But. I was asking about retirement and what he's up to. It was John Kukaldi. I don't know if you remember. He raced very successfully in America. And he said, the advice I can give you is not to think about it or plan too much because then you're sort of one foot out the door. And that's what you're saying. Like, yeah, it's there. And I know it'll be there, but I'm so focused on this. I think that's the only healthy way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so and, when it will be time, uh, yeah, again, it's priority. So my priority is this. And I, of course, I know it's going to be challenging, you know, when you're, and I think we don't talk enough about uh, athletes retiring from what they do. You, It's like a drug, you know, you're training, you have this adrenaline. You have, so when you are like not racing anymore, I have a bit touchy this year. It's really hard to handle. And I know it's going to be not easy time, but I know it will be a great process. So I'm confident I will have tools to, to handle it because I have developed. But definitely it's important, I feel like, to listen to your needs and to see how they can be met differently. 
and uh and to to yeah to to just like do something you love different and uh and accept uh you can still have some adrenaline by not uh not racing a time so um I, I'm not uh, like, I can't wait to have this period of life because I know this won't be easy, but it will be okay. I'm confident. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's for sure one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging. And people from the outside say I've transitioned very well. Um, but I must say mentally, it's the biggest challenge stepping away. I so guess. I my, guess yeah. my advice would be if your heart's still in it, don't rush away from racing because it's, it's there, there is more to life don't get me wrong and i'm very grateful but i must say it's a continual yeah, mental yeah. challenge uh, and we see it with sportsmen and you're yeah. right no one talks about it enough there's barely any resources um my uh michael phelps co-produced a documentary um i forget the name and it talks to athletes after these olympic cycles as well as retiring and and i've seen yeah. it myself with some people that's why they turn to drugs, turn to alcohol to fill the void yeah. of, of the, it's almost like a death. But if you're aware and reflective that it is going to be difficult and you, and you build a family, yeah. you have a good family, a team around you through that process, all this mental coach becomes yeah. a life coach, you know, because it will yeah. be a big, yeah, yeah. big challenge for sure. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, from the base, it's important to come back to where you come from, and to know like uh, that was a time of your life, and uh, and it will keep going differently. Yeah, exactly. Change is constant, they say. And um, mm -hmm. but positive things: uh, New Zealand in the off season coming up. Yeah. For the first time, how I cannot stop <laughs> without going to New Zealand. I've never been there, and we are going, yeah, in uh, this winter, a bit of Australia and New Zealand. So uh, I'm super excited about it. What are you most excited about? Something new <laughs> or Queenstown? What just what are like you yeah, Queens Queenstown, like everybody has said. The people in their eyes, when they say Queenstown, is like there is something with this town because everybody is just like, oh, that's amazing. So I just can't wait and to to do some good riding with the team, being in the sun. So it's gonna be be cool. Uh, I like it, and it's gonna be different from every other winter training. Oh, you're going to love it. It's lighting up my eyes. I mean, I don't oh. want to get on a plane <laughs> all the time, but if someone said you had to go to Queenstown again, I would. the bags would be oh. packed already. Yeah, you, you'll love it. And the ride, like the cool. downhilling, like I said to you here in South Africa, it seems like in Leger there'll be off-piece stuff that's illegal or not marked, and then there it's similar tracks, but they're marked. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay, these are legal trails. Let's go down there. Great. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, can't wait. No, you're gonna you're gonna Big love surprise. it. It's so so cool. So then next yeah. year, are, are you able to set goals, or is everything just seeing how it unfolds, um, like all these progression and steps? Yes. So we I've made a plan, yeah, with my coach uh, last week, and uh, but we we both know that. Uh, we don't really know how things will go. So this is why we take this first month to really build some foundation and see how it goes. But uh, yeah, the plan is just to to don't rush things and to yeah to use everything we've learned to to grow through to go through the process and uh, do a lot of. Uh, of riding i didn't ride much uh, this year so catch up a bit with the riding but uh yeah being smart i would say and balanced <laughs> and do you think you've found the balance now or you will have found the balance 
after all these yeah, years? Yeah, honestly, I feel, yeah, I feel, I feel the, despite this time, I feel really good. I know it's not going to be easy, but I feel really good. And you know, after, I'm, I say it again, but after what I felt, everything is just so good. So you're just even more grateful. And I, I let go easily before to let go of something was really hard. So I am super committed, but I'm also aware maybe it might not work and I will see what, uh, how it goes. And if it, it doesn't work, you know, like I cannot go against it, you know, so I'm just going to take what life gives me and, and with a big smile and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. How much do you trust the universe or your gut feelings or the way it's meant to be? lack of a better term uh yeah you know i really when i lost the world champs title for 0 0.017 in australia i was like everyone everybody was just like oh so close i was like but that was just not meant to be you know that's it it's just the way it was written because there were a mistake in my time. I came down, I was 17 and I was like, yeah, I did a shitty run and that wasn't good riding. And everybody were like, but you're 17. And I was like, yeah, I didn't ride good. And then they were like, oh, you're second finally. There were a mistake in your time. And I was like, second, oh, cool. 0 017 second <laughs> i was like oh that's light i thought i was 17 so second is not too bad and that was <laughs> behind miranda and i loved miranda so it was cool so yeah i do trust that things come um when they are supposed to come so if uh, if it's your time it's your your time and if things doesn't work you know i, I will take it like uh, it's just to protect me so we will see but i am super committed and uh, i'm confident and you did sort of i don't know if struggle is the right word but get a lot of medals and second places at worlds before it clicked like what was it like when it did click what is what is that feeling mm. like it was amazing because i had been injured for six months with my foot and I won and it was a great lesson because it's just like when you have no expectation, this is when you do your best, you know. I was just there riding and not waiting for anything, but just riding and it worked. So I was just over the moon. And when you do it for a second time in Vadisol, where I had more experience and I was more um waited like everybody was waiting for me and then it clicked this one felt special as well and what is good is both of them were completely different so it's just I realize now that it's forever you know like before I was like yeah it's cool I won world champs and now I'm like no one can get you you know it's forever that you have them so it's cool <laughs> Yeah, I, I cannot relate, but they certainly look really good. And, and I think winning twice, like like you, no one can take <laughs> that away. I guess if the career, mm. you know, like could you be satisfied with the career? But earlier you said like there's still something you feel you need to give. Like yeah. you've got something I, burning I inside you, even though you've got these titles. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If I had to stop now, I would be super frustrated because I I feel like I have so much more to give and and to race smarter to to yeah to race uh, yeah so so I would I would be pissed off if I had to to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, I think. I think that's a pretty good way to start uh, winding down. <laughs> I did want to know what what keeps you busy when you're not riding or 
when you need to reset from riding? Like, uh, what hobbies or passions do you have to like get your mind off biking? I I love like you know because I'm always surrounded by men. It's good to go home. In a, where I live, is super chill. Like it's kind of lost. There is no nothing going on, and I, I love to just uh, hang out here and have my family who lives around with some. I've got uh, two nephew and a niece, so I love taking care of them, bringing them biking and and biking moto and and bike. And I love to see some girls, so my friend. I love to spend time with my friends, going shopping and having nice coffee. And I, I am really passionate about coffee. I love drinking good coffee. So that's the second Sunday I spent cleaning my machine <laughs> because it was off for six months and something is going wrong. It's not working properly. So <laughs> I did spend a lot of time doing this. And otherwise, I love doing all the sport like moto and duro. I don't post so much because we are not allowed to ride <laughs> where we do, but I do ride a lot of moto and duro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know the feeling. It's the, the coffee's good in South Africa. I don't drink coffee, but I've been told it's pretty good in oh, South Africa. Oh, you don't drink coffee? Yeah, no. it, it was really nice. We had uh, some really nice coffee in South Africa, some good wine, good coffee, good food. You're like a He enjoyed the <laughs> wine a lot, apparently. <laughs> yeah, we did this wine tasting in, oh, Babylon's Torrent. I don't have it anymore. So, yeah, we had some nice, uh, nice time out there. There is some really good wine. Yeah, well, uh, as you said, you, you don't think it'll be your last trip down to the Cape Town area for some riding. So uh, hopefully we get some more proper riding in next time. For sure. For sure. I can't wait. That was super, super good riding. Too quick. But uh, yeah, we did the front shark, Banuk, and behind you at the shop. I don't know why. Hel Helderberg. Helderberg Trails. Held ah, yeah, yeah. Helderberg. Older. That was one of there were so, yeah, both, a few questions, but I think we've covered all of them. They asked of your favorite trail at Halderberg, but I I really only took you down OG. You wouldn't have remembered yeah. the names because we it was quite a quick yeah, ride yeah, it, up and down. OG, yeah, uh, OG was super good, and uh, yeah, I have to come back to it. All the jumps and uh, and it's flowy from what I. What I would say if I had to pick one word for this track is just a flow. The flow is insane. I, I mean, like crazy. There, you heard it so here. Good. One of the world's best downhill mountain bikers. And uh, she's ridden all over yeah. the world, except New Zealand. So we will see what yeah. she says about <laughs> Queenstown. There's some good flow in Queenstown as well. So uh, I'll tell yeah. the trail builders. They'll be so stoked to hear that. Well, Miriam, this was uh, fascinating, and I look forward to more chats at the races and on some of some yeah. of your holidays. And all the best for the year, and uh, you're an inspiration for you know the motivation you have for coming back from the injuries, doing a, a degree while racing. Like it's just so impressive. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate awesome. and it was a good time and it's good to share. Well, fans, you know what to do. Make sure you follow the show and make sure you follow Miriam Nicole on Instagram to stay up to date with what she's up to. And if you don't know, we are on YouTube. So some of you might have watched this interview and show on YouTube. If you haven't, go to Moving the Needle podcast and Crank Brothers is giving away some shoes and pedals for one of the lucky subscribers. Till the next episode, peace.